Hey everyone, uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, a new project called Diffusion Models Without Attention. This project was led by Nathan Yan and Jiatao Gu, uh, and thanks to Apple for providing the compute for this project. I'm going to be focusing on image generation today. By now you've seen all the incredible approaches for image generation, both from proprietary models and from open source techniques. As we can see from this slide, uh, if we look at equation 36, Actually, just kidding. Uh, diffusion's really complicated. I'm not even going to try to explain the details today in this talk. Um, instead, let's just look at this one minor term that we can see ends up in the final term that we need to perform diffusion. Specifically, the term tells us that we need to model the probability of xt conditioned on xt plus 1, and we get to do that with a neural network theta of our choosing. This equation basically says that we need to take some noise and try to improve it to look more like an image. We can pick any network theta that we think will best do this job and train the parameters of theta on a large data set. One piece of background that's worth noting is that it seems to be very important to use a global model for this term theta. And one model that's become particularly popular is to use self-attention. Of course, as we know, self-attention corresponds to connecting every aspect of the previous layer to every aspect of the next layer. This is a great way to model global interactions, but of course it has quadratic computation. As the number of elements we have grows, we pay a quadratic price. This self-attention term is mitigated in various ways by different diffusion models. One popular choice is to use a unit which corresponds to running several different layers of downsampling before applying self-attention. The downsampling gets us to a point that we are only applying self-attention to effectively a 16 by 16 image. This saves on the cost of applying quadratic self-attention. After applying self-attention, we then upsample back to the original size so that we can predict the new denoised image. For different architectures, other compression approaches are used. When applying transformers for diffusion, we will patchify our image before applying self-attention. This corresponds to splitting up the image into patches. Working with these patches reduces the effective size of the image. We then flatten each of these patches to get a sequence and this sequence is fed into a transformer block. This corresponds to self-attention at the level of patches. We then repeatedly apply self-attention and feedforward networks to produce our final image. Yeah, you get it. It's a transformer. You've seen that a million times before. One interesting phenomena is that these types of compression really do seem to hurt the quality of the final image. In the paper DIT, which is the baseline for this work, they show that decreasing the patch size leads to much better images. This is true even as you increase the transformer size. If you have two large patches, you get very poor quality in your final image. Based on this context, we were interested in a very simple question. Can you run diffusion models with other forms of global interactions? In particular, we were interested in trying out diffusion models with a form of a recurrent neural network. This would give us the same form of global interactions we had with attention, but would potentially give us subquadratic computation in the length of the image. Here I use length to represent the linearized form of the image, like when we pass it into a transformer. There are actually many different forms of these modern recurrent neural networks. If you're interested in this topic, you can see one of my previous videos. I'll put a link in the comments. It describes the current state of the RNN renaissance. In this work, we are going to try applying a state space model. I'm going to try to describe state space models in a single slide. The main idea is that they provide a method for taking a linear RNN parameterization represented by the matrices on the left of the slide. We can then represent these parameters as a very, very long convolution. We'll call that K. You can think about this as a kernel that's as long as the length of the entire image. However, we can efficiently apply this kernel by computing a convolution. This can be done by computing a fast Fourier transform. This allows us to run the kernel over our input to produce our output in subquadratic time. 
Again, there are a lot more details here, but you can effectively think about this as a very fast, modern, recurrent neural network. Utilizing this approach, we can apply it to diffusion by taking our original image, flattening it into a sequence, and applying a new neural network block, which we call diffusum, over the flattened image. Note that we don't do any patchifying or subsampling in order to compute the input. The output is another sequence. This sequence can then be reshaped into our denoised image. It would be nice if this worked out of the box, but we have to be a little bit more clever to get the SSM to work as well as attention. The main trick is going to be an adaptation of an architecture we used in a previous work, which we call BIGS. This is very similar to architectures that have been used for gated state space models, as well as the H3 model and the recent Mamba model. The main idea is that instead of splitting out the main routing layer, in this case in SSM, and the feedforward network, as would be typical for a transformer, we're instead going to arrange them in a gating style architecture. Basically, we're going to sandwich the SSM layer within two sets of MLPs. I don't have any great explanation for why this works so well, but empirically it seems to perform a lot better in practice. The first MLP is going to act on a downscaled version of the image, and after applying the MLP, we'll then upscale it to the full length. We do this to reduce the cost of running more MLPs over the finer grained image. Next, we apply our SSM layer. Actually, we apply two SSM layers, one forward and one backwards. You can think of this like a bidirectional RNN. It allows us to pass information both left to right and right to left over the linearized image. Finally, we apply our gating layer. This combines our forward and backward SSMs with the MLP over the input. This gating layer allows the input to control how the SSM is used and what information gets passed to the next layer. In practice, the Excel version of our model has about 30 of these layers for a total of around 700 million parameters. However, the details of this architecture are less important than its scaling properties. The main punchline of this work is that if we can make this architecture work nearly as well as attention, it has much better scaling properties. In particular, if we look at these two lines, the green one and the one below it, we can see that an SSM, when increased twice in length, scales about twice as many flops. This is a nice property as it indicates that we're spending most of our time running the standard MLP layers in the neural network. We can contrast this with the scaling of using attention. For an attention-based model, when we get to much longer length outputs, we see a quadratic curve where we start paying much more for the attention part of the model. As we get to finer grain models, this can hurt us even more. Of course, none of this even matters if our images don't look any good. Um, I'm an NLP person, so I have trouble figuring out what good images even look like. Um, but here are some of the images from our paper. I'm told that these look pretty good. Uh, a lot of them have particularly nice details if you zoom in. I'm somewhat more comfortable talking about the actual metrics. Here are the numbers on class conditional image net generation with an original image of size 256 by 256. The main baseline for this paper is the DIT transformer architecture with patches of size 2x2. Two two. We compare our Diffusum XL model, which has the same number of parameters but less patching. The blue graph represents the raw models without classifier-free guidance. We see that Diffusum performs better in terms of FID score than the DIT XL model and it also uses 20% less flops during training. When we apply classifier-free guidance on the orange side of the graph, we see that the two achieve comparable results with again diffusum using significantly less flops. Both these models are now roughly state-of-the-art for this task. There are some other orthogonal approaches that should improve performance, 
but we mainly wanted to compare directly apples to apples with a transformer-based approach. We also compared the approach using larger images. Here we do generation for images of size 512 by 512. For these experiments, we compare using classifier-free guidance. We see that both DIT and Diffusum outperform all other approaches for this task. Diffusum is slightly worse than DIT for this task, but uses about 30% less flops due to some computation limitations. Here are some of the images at the 512 by 512 size. You can check out the paper for higher quality images. Hopefully YouTube compression doesn't kill my owls or dogs. In addition to class conditional generation, we also run using unconditional generation. For this, we use the LSUN benchmark and look at different pictures of churches and bedrooms. We find that the diffusion approach performs nearly identical to other approaches for diffusion on these tasks. You can check out the paper for a wider set of analyses. Here's one that I found particularly interesting. Uh, we can look back at some of the experiments we saw earlier in the talk in particular, the impact of compression on the model's final performance. We find that with various forms of compression on the length, we get significantly worse images. Uh, this corresponds to the previous experiments from the DIT paper, but it's interesting to see again in practice with our model. This again indicates that working with finer grained versions of the images leads to better generations. So in conclusion, the story here is quite simple. We think that global attention or global models in general are necessary for diffusion-based models. While global attention is good, it leads to negative trade-offs. Previous approaches are often too willing to compress images in order to apply attention at a coarser granularity. Recent approaches like state-space models offer a way to get global interactions with better trade-offs. We hope our results show that you can apply SSMs and get near linear scaling without giving up on the benefits of these global interactions. In images, this is useful for higher resolutions, but in future applications, such as video or 3D, this might be necessary for getting very long range interactions without paying the high cost of quadratic attention. That's it for today. Thanks for listening. I'll add some more links to other papers or interesting tutorials to read in the description.